West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy with Chef Justice Putnam. Netrootsradio.com Hayes, a Democratic president is now poised to put a justice on the U.S. Supreme Court for the first time in more than a decade. As soon as this week, Judge Ketanji Brown Jackson will be confirmed to the court with bipartisan support. And that's despite the best efforts of some Senate Republicans who tried to essentially assassinate Judge Jackson's character by painting her as sympathetic to child abusers. The behavior by Republicans in the House and in the U.S. Senate, particularly at the hearings, has been disturbing shocking language and rhetoric used as a political smear by people who, well, know better. I want to make certain that we protect children and that we continue to do our best effort to protect children. I also want to make certain that we're going to have judges on the federal bench and justices that are going to protect those rights of children. Significant concern has been raised by myself and others uh, about Judge Jackson's uh, pattern in sentencing criminal defendants guilty of either possession or distribution of child pornography. We're talking about eight-year-olds and nine-year-olds and 11-year-olds and 12-year-olds. He's got images of these, the government said added up to over 600 images, gobs of video footage of these children but you say this does not signal a heinous or egregious child pornography offense. Just to be clear, that pattern that Cruz was talking about was nonsense. It was no different than many other federal judges, some of whom were Republicans, some of whom who sailed through confirmation. And of course, not every Republican senator joined in that despicable behavior. In fact, three of them said they would vote to confirm Judge Jackson. And for that crime, those senators were attacked by Republican Party star Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene, who said they were being, quote, pro-pedophile. Pro-pedophile. When Green first joined the House, her overt sympathies for the QAnon conspiracy theory, which believes that Democrats, the so-called deep state and the media are secretly part of a massive child trafficking ring, that was a big deal. She had to go back and like delete a bunch of posts, and it was something of a political problem for Republican leader Kevin McCarthy. But alas, as time has moved on, the party has only moved towards Green and embraced QAnon. And that's why they tried to make Judge Jackson's hearing a referendum on whether you are not, in Marjorie Taylor Greene's words here, pro or anti-pedophile. That's what it is. Republicans are cultivating this. They have been for a long time. You could trace it back to the 2016 election when the so-called Pizzagate conspiracy theory came into being, which emerged out of the hacked emails that were published. And that bizarre and inscrutable theory alleged that Hillary Clinton and prominent Democrats ran a child sex and sacrifice ring out of the basement of a popular D.C. based pizza restaurant called Comet Ping Pong Pizza, which, by the way, doesn't have a basement. But the conspiracy percolated in far right media. And then this happened. 
Under arrest in Washington, 28-year-old Edgar Welch, accused of firing an assault weapon inside the Comet Ping Pong Pizza Restaurant. Welch allegedly told police he came to investigate Pizzagate, an internet rumor alleging a Clinton campaign child sex ring. An armed man gets himself to the pizza shop and shows up with an assault rifle, which he fired because he had been told and believed that the Democrats were running a satanic child sex ring in the building's non-existent basement. That man, by the way, was sentenced to four years in jail by none other than then District Judge Katanji Brown Jackson. But here's the thing. Republicans were and still are actively cultivating the dangerous fringe beliefs that that individual held. According to one recent poll, 16% of Americans, that's 16% of Americans, not a majority, but a sizable amount, believe, and I quote, the government, media, and financial worlds in the U.S. are controlled by a group of Satan-worshipping pedophiles who run a global child sex trafficking operation. Think about your belief system to answer yes to that question. 25% of the Republican Party identify as QAnon believers. Now, these Republican politicians and their allies in conservative media cannot just come out and say, There is an evil cabal of liberals running a child sex trafficking ring around the world dominated by George Soros, the Rothschilds, and the Clintons, and they also worship Satan. They realize they sound nuts. So instead, they find these not-so-clever ways to play footsie with the people that do believe that, that make up at least a quarter of the base of their party. Like accusing Judge Jackson of being sympathetic to child abusers, wink wink. Or adopting the slogan, save the children, which of course sounds perfectly noble, innocent enough on its face, but as Associate Press reports, has actually become a dog whistle to QAnon supporters. Or, more recently, through vague allegations of grooming, an age-old smear to imply that members of LGBTQ community are trying to prime children for sexual abuse. That appears to be the case in Florida, and the basis behind the state's so-called Don't Say Gay Bill, which prohibits the discussion, the discussion, in class of sexual orientation or gender identity in classrooms for young children. Now, some Republicans will try to lie and say the bill is the laws about parents' rights or other nonsense. But Republican Governor Ron DeSantis' spokesperson gave away the whole game. She, sort of like Marjorie Taylor Greene, wasn't quite like with it enough to kind of keep it quiet. She said, the bill that liberals inaccurately called Don't Say Gay would be more accurately described as the anti-grooming bill. And quote, if you're against the anti-grooming bill, you're probably a groomer. Or at least you don't denounce the grooming of 48-year-old children. Silence is complicit. Just, I want everyone to focus on what she is accusing people of here. There it is. She said the quiet part loud. If you don't agree with the bill, you are actively cultivating young children to sexually abuse them. Everything you don't like is the work of this nefarious cabal of pedophiles who are literally attempting to institutionalize systematic sexual molestation of children. If you're a Democrat, you're either a pedophile or a pedophile sympathizer. If you're a gay teacher who mentions, I don't know, going away with your husband this weekend, you're doing the same. And this rhetoric, it's not fringe, that's the spokesperson, Ron DeSantis, become omnipresent in right-wing media. Just this past week, Fox News had a collective meltdown accusing Disney, the Disney Corporation of all companies, of grooming children. If you really want to talk to a five-year-old or a seven-year-old or an eight-year-old about their sexuality and and gender, that's on you. You're a pervert. You're a weirdo. The fact that they want to sexualize our children and our children's childhoods for their own political agenda is incredibly disturbing. Why not just rename the roller coaster, you know, Sex Mountain? Come on, kids. It'll be a blast. Okay. There's a lot to say about this, but by the way, go look at the Disney canon. Just, like, fire up the old... uh, Little Mermaid, okay? <laughs> See, like, you know, the, the teenager who sells her voice because a guy was cute? Okay, so just that to start with. But to be clear, this is QAnon all the way down. Republicans are repurposing old smears to taint Democrats as part of a shadowy cabal of child sex abusers. And again, what's so disgusting and, and gross about this is that, of course, child sexual abuse is an extremely real problem shockingly ubiquitous, in fact, everywhere throughout society, in all kinds of institutions, across the political and cultural spectrum, liberal, conservative, secular, religious, just all over the place. No one's got a monopoly on it. 
like, I don't know, let me think of an example, like, I don't know, the longest serving Republican Speaker of the House. The fallout keeps growing tonight over the surprise indictment of former House Speaker Dennis Hastert. The allegations that Hastert was willing to pay millions to cover up sexual misconduct with a male student have shocked many, especially in Yorkville, Illinois. That's where Hastert used to coach and teach. A male student when he was uh, a wrestling coach there. It's odd, isn't it? The Republicans never bring up Dennis Hastert, who was accused of child sexual abuse when they are talking about the apparent cabal of pedophiles in the government. Or former Republican Congressman Mark Foley, who of course resigned in disgrace after he was caught sending sexually explicit messages to teenage boys who worked as congressional pages. Or failed Republican Senate candidate from Alabama, Judge Roy Moore, who leading Republicans, including Trump, defended after he was accused of pursuing sexual relationships with teenage girls while he was in his 30s, including one girl he pursued while she was 14 years old and he was 32 after they met at the courthouse where her mother was appearing for a child custody hearing. Think about that. Now, he denies this, but I leave the word for that kind of behavior. Again, if it happened, maybe you believe Roy Moore is grooming. Right-wing media closed ranks around Moore. The Federalist even ran an op-ed defending his content, conduct as alleged, writing, quote, to have a large family, the wife must start having kids when she is young. The husband needs to be well-established and able to support the family, in which case he will typically need to marry when older. Again, a 14-year-old at her mom's child custody hearing getting hit on, allegedly, by a 32-year-old prosecutor outside the courthouse. Donald Trump even endorsed Moore's run after the allegations surfaced that that's what he was doing. Or I don't know, here's another example. How about the time that Tucker Carlson decided to defend Warren Jeffs, the fundamentalist cult leader, currently in prison for child rape? Carlson said that he's in prison for his, quote, weird and unpopular beliefs, like the forced marriage of underage girls. He was convicted of two counts of felony child sexual assault. Tucker thought that was unjustified. Actually, right now, there's a sitting member of Congress on the House Judiciary Committee, Republican Matt Gates, who is reportedly under investigation, federal investigation for sex trafficking underage girl. That's, again, something he denies. And, you know, innocent proved guilty. Hasn't even been charged. But again, <laughs> if you're a party that's super, super, super keyed into this, you might be a little worried about that, right? Maybe have a little conversation with him. What's going on there? Oh, yes. And Tennessee Republicans have a bill they advanced today, actually, that would, and I am not making this up, and I didn't believe it when I thought so, but I actually read it through, to eliminate any minimum age requirement for marriage right now in 2022. Right now it is a minimum of 17 years, and they're going to just get rid of the minimum age. Now, if Democrats did any of these things, like that Tennessee bill, the right would lose its collective mind, and it would call them groomers and pedophiles. But of course, again, this is all bad faith. There's not an actual interest in protecting children here. It's not motivating it, which is part of what makes it so disgusting because children do need protection. But this is a disgusting and cynical attempt to render the political opposition essentially as hateable as possible, as sort of irredeemably evil, like the worst thing you could be. It's loathsome, and they know what they're doing. It is Wednesday, the 6th of April of 2022, and you are in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. I am your chef de cuisine, Justice Putnam. Gunner the English Bulldog is our snoozing sous chef. And our daily special is Smothered Benedict Wednesdays. A lovely, lovely egg dish with an equally lovely and very velvety hollandaise sauce made, well, uh, to perfection, if I might boast. Yes. And also, will no one rid us of these meddlesome priests? Because we have to make that nod to the movie and novel Beckett. Is it a novel? <laughs> sort of. How are you doing? Well, I hope you're doing fine in spite of how the world is going. How is it possible that Joe Biden can have... I got to tell you, you know, lowest uh, unemployment numbers in over almost 60 years. Uh, job numbers are through the roof, uh, greater than ever been in about 60 years. Uh, the world 
really looks to Joe Biden to set the tone on how we are attending to Vladimir Putin and his imperialistic endeavors. Except here in America, Joe Biden is apparently hated for being I don't know what. (laughs) What is it? We have... You know, I used to joke about this. Yo, they're all fifth columnists. I'm not joking anymore. There are definite fifth columnists in the United States determined to bring it down, and they are working actively out in the open. (sighs) Colin Kaepernick can't take a knee in silent reverence over the dead. The black men killed. The black women killed. With no trial, <laughs> no no jury of their peers, they canceled him. Oh, some might say, oh, well, like, yeah, sure, but he's got a, like a really uh, profitable charity and he's doing all this work because of all the money he's raking in. Well, you know what? He wouldn't be doing that if he had a, if he was still playing. Well, he, he would be doing that. I'm just saying that that wouldn't be much of an excuse if he was still playing in the NFL. When you have crystal fascists who uh, play sports quite often and no one bats an eye. A little peeved. And in the midst of it, there's all this personal stuff going on, like machinery here at the radio station that seems to be degrading. Ooh. Yeah, what's that about? Well, our MacBook, which was a refurbished machine when I received it about six years ago. And we hardly ever turn it off because it's the broadcaster. And I'm getting notices about uh, the hard drive getting filled up. So you know what that means? (laughs) Yeah. Push comes to shove. I guess I'm getting pushed and shoved. Getting to be the point where there's no choice. Yeah, I'm looking into pulling an external hard drive. I hope it's compatible. I hope it has at least a terabyte of power in it. I hope. Otherwise, you know, I have to go get another one anyway. But I suppose that and, um, you know, I do have some Lacy's. I've got a couple of those. I should check those out too. But regardless, I need to free up space on the Mac. And I, you know, yeah, I can figure my way around these machines. But I'm no computer tech. (laughs) There's a lot of stuff I don't know. Like, where do you find the stupid files to be able to clean up the hard drive? Well, I'll look for it again after I was given uh, some pretty good instructions by Tom. Thanks, Tom. So uh, if there are some interruptions during the uh, broadcast, that's why. Because we may have had to reboot the broadcaster. Well, actually, the broadcaster doesn't necessarily have to be rebooted. But the machine that the broadcaster is on, the MacBook, uh, might need to be rebooted. It'll take a few moments. So just refresh your browsers and your players and everything should be fine after, you know, about three to five minutes or well, less, less three to five, we'll say. So that's what's going on around here at the mothership. And uh, yeah, I was up last night uh, dumping show files. You know, (laughs) I don't know. You can't keep all that clutter just cluttering up forever. (laughs) Man, there was like uh, stuff from way back, like 2014. You know, that's quite a ways back, <laughs> considering our 11-year run. <laughs> yeah. Well, not on that machine, but at least on the on the uh, Dell laptop. I've got a lot of old, old, old stuff there in the Dell laptop. That's still on Windows 7. Jeez. We're going to have to upgrade. Well, we did do a bit of machinery upgrades and stuff uh, around, well, around Christmas time. And, uh, yeah, you know, we always have these appeals for funds and sometimes we have to make a more concerted appeal. Um, kind of feel hesitant about doing that. I mean, I think the constant appeals on every show, of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy about going to our Patreon page and becoming a recurring Patreon, that should be enough. But it's just a reminder that, um, uh, 
nothing is forever. <laughs> it wears out. Oh, yeah. Speaking of which, wearing out. One of my favorite teachers from high school, Mr. Jack Woy, passed away just before turning 81. Uh, well, uh, recently, a couple of days ago. And uh, I took algebra, geometry, and trig from him, and I was no math person. In fact, I used to revolt against it. Uh, I had the constant teenager excuse, you know, the one, the teenagers are, are, are like, oh, well, I want to opt for laziness. I had the great lazy argument of like, well, I don't know how this is going to be used in the real world. And then you get uh, building houses and you can't square a corner because you should have stayed awake in your trig class. I'm just saying. All right. There's an equation for that, you know. And every carpenter knows it. So you might as well learn it. <laughs> well, fortunately, I knew how to square a corner. But then I realized, oh, so <laughs> squaring a corner is actually using uh, this uh, vaunted mathematics in the real world. Because it's all in the real world, even down in the uh, quantum mechanics level. Okay, so I went a long ways about that. But, oh, yeah, so Mr. Jack Woy, uh, at El Dorado High School back in the day, quite a fellow, did a lot of, did a lot of traveling. Uh, not a teacher who took himself seriously. He was somewhat of a joker, but I would also say... Um, not you know, maybe elegant is the incorrect term, but uh, he was well balanced. Let's just put it that way. And he and his wife, after his teaching career, uh, moved to Northern California, and that's where they resided when he passed. And uh, continued to travel and do all sorts of things, and so good for him. He was my uh, freshman football coach, and I actually looked at him as one of the types that. You know, he could motivate without uh, belittling, whereas, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of coaches who do a lot of yelling, you know, sputtering, you know, you women, you're little girls. You used to hear that a lot. <laughs> it's a toxic masculinity, I guess. <laughs> Homophobic, too. But uh, uh, Mr. Woy uh, never had to resort to that. Um, a lot of people think that if you're too nice, people aren't going to respect you. Well, you can be nice and firm at the same time. You can be firm without belittling. You can be firm without tearing someone a new, you know what? So rest in peace, Mr. Roy. You were a good man. All right. So what's on the rest of the menu? We should abbreviate this, uh, this morning rant, because we do have a bit of news to uh, impart to you. So what is on the menu here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy on this fine smothered Benedict Wednesdays? At the top, yeah, the new Republican tactic of smearing everyone who disagrees with them as supporting pedophilia is a disgusting and cynical attempt to render their political opposition as hateable as possible. Of course. <laughs> it's just another tactic. That's what they've been doing all the time. Remember when it was just simple enough to call somebody a liberal and they go, God, I hate them. Well, now they got to resort to pedophilia. All right. Commie. Commie pedophile. All right. I think you're calling yourself something. You know, they're, they're saying this. While well, Tennessee, and I got to admit, 12 other states have no limits on child brides. Okay. Tennessee's just the latest one who's taking away any limits on how young a, a girl has to be to, to get married. So it's not child abuse in Tennessee in those 12 other states if you marry them. Okay. Well, rabies get to choose their kids and their wives. On the rest of the menu, Rick Scott voted against American manufacturing ideas he touted in his own plan. That's how they work. A Trump, a former Trump administration official who is now running for a House seat in New Hampshire voted twice in the 2016 GOP presidential primary, and he admitted he did it to help Donald. Voted in two states. 
And the House will vote today on whether to hold former Trump advisors Peter Navarro and Dan Scavino in contempt of Congress. Well, it's about time. After the break, we move to the chef's table where a Nigerian atheist was sentenced to 24 years in prison for blasphemy over Facebook posts. Yeah. Come into a community near you in the great United States of America. And two of Charles Darwin's notebooks stolen from Cambridge University's library have been returned two decades after they disappeared. All that and more on West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon Appetit. Page at netrootsradio.com to the right of the page is the chat room link. And the chat room is monitored by Kelly Lincoln. Thank you, Kelly. To the left of the chat room link near the bottom of our homepage at netrootsradio.com is that Patreon link I referred to earlier. And if you could become a recurring Patreon of Netroots Radio, it really does help us. And thank you to those of you who have been recurring Patreons of Netroots Radio. Oh, those these so many years, it's really helped. Now, for those of you who might consider doing so, if you could afford an espresso-type coffee drink and send those funds to us once a month, or how about two espresso coffee drinks? Yeah, well, if you could afford one or two, if you could send those funds our way, we are able to stretch those dollars beyond compare. And we have over a decade of experience of doing so. And uh, then we are able to pay our bills, fly under the radar, and continue this powerhouse of resistance that uh, has been a bulwark, however small we are, you know, we're a powerhouse. Uh, yeah, we're a bulwark against these dark forces arrayed against the United States of America and representative democracy itself around the world. Thank you for your generosity. If you would like to follow Netroots Radio on Twitter, do so at Netroots Radio. Tom takes care of that. Thank you, Tom. And also, thank you, Tom and Kelly, for uh, the help on uh, on keeping these machines uh, oiled and uh, and everything. I wouldn't be able to do any of this without our great team. Thank you, team. Thank you, Tom, and thank you, team. <laughs> if you would like to follow me on Twitter, do so. I suggest you do. Follow me at Justice Putnam at, on Twitter, and I post the show notes and links diary about 10 minutes before showtime. I get that linked up, of course, on Twitter and other social media platforms. You know who they are. Oh, yeah. Elon, is it Elon or Ellen? <laughs> well, that Musk guy uh, asked yesterday, do you want an edit button? And up until that point when he asked, I, I really did. And now I don't. But I guess we're getting an edit button now, whether we like it or not. <laughs> God. All right. I love that everybody says he's a free speech purist. He's such a Free speech purist, he's getting sued for apartheid at his Tesla factories. Yeah, and I'm not kidding. There is absolute and real apartheid going on at his Tesla factories. It's so, well, you know, when uh, when you're an heir to blood emeralds, I guess you think uh, putting an electric Tesla car up in outer space just to float around, I don't know. Is it going to fall back into the atmosphere or is it going to go into the sun? If you can afford to do that, um, maybe you shouldn't be allowed to be a free speech purist because I don't think you know what free speech is. But that's my little rant there. All right. 
<laughs> anyway, follow the show on Twitter at Cookbook West and pick up podcasts by way of Spreaker, Stitcher, TuneIn, iHeart, YouTube, iTunes, etc., etc., etc. And of course, also pick up the uh, Netroots Radio Library, the Deep Archive, over there at Internet Archive at archive.org. All right, this uh, first offering in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy is Out of the American Independent by Josh Israel. On February 10th, Rick Scott gave a speech at the pro-Trump America First Policy Institute that included 10 ideas for how the United States could beat our enemy, China, and what he called a new Cold War. On March 28th, Scott was one of just 28 senators, all Republicans, who voted against H.R. 4521, the United States Innovation and Com- Competition Act of 2021, also known as the America Competes Act, which passed in the Senate. The bill, backed by Biden, would invest billions in American manufacturing and enhance the ability of domestic businesses to compete internationally. And for that, the, these fifth colonists have to destroy America. In this reporter's opinion, the bill contains no provisions that would do several of the exact things Scott proposed in February. Or it does. The bill contains provisions that would do several of the exact things Scott proposed in February. You know, when Obama visited the White House yesterday, I was reminded how that administration bent over backwards to give everything the GOP wanted. Their own language. They would lift bills that the GOP wrote and put it into their uh, their policy and it would get obstructed. Indeed. All right. This is like a carryover then from the good old days. During his speech, uh, Scott lauded Trump, who repeatedly praised and defended the Chinese regime during his single term in the White House for having opened the eyes of everyday Americans to the goals of that evil regime. (laughs) Yeah, give me a break. What are you talking about? I mean, some of us are old enough to remember when uh, Nixon went to China. Talk to me about we're now opening our eyes. How about when that lone guy stopped all those tanks on Tiananmen Square in 1989? Rick Scott. I don't think he was really on this earth then, was he? He is an alien from outer space. Look at him. He then described the 10 ideas for policies he would like to see adopted, including some of the exact policy ideas Scott scolded scolded Biden for not adopting. If you look around, the majority of things Americans use on a daily basis are made in communist China, Scott said. An easy first step every American can take is to start thinking about where things are made and choose products not made in communist China. You know, I've been arguing this since the Republicans first started offshoring all of our manufacturing to China. You know, I was with a group of guys. We developed these toys, little wooden toys that were actually quite lovely uh, with tracks and, and carts and alphabet blocks for little kids. But we couldn't compete because everybody was making their stuff in China. And everybody, when I say everybody is making their stuff in China, I'm talking about the most virulent, right-wing, uh, uh, capitalist-minded libertarians. Just saying. If it wasn't for them, we might have some manufacturing here in the United States. Now, the Competes Bill establishes an office to promote American-made goods, creates a supply chain database and toolkit, establishes a buyamerican.gov website, and invests billions of dollars in funding to help manufacture more items like microchips domestically. Well, we can't have that because that's socialism. 
<sighs> Section 3407 of the Competes Act would provide an annual review on the presence of Chinese companies in the United States capital markets to describe all risks posed by the presence of in the United States capital markets of companies incorporated in the People's Republic of China. Of course, Scott urged, we have to stop giving U.S. capital to Chinese-based companies through our stock exchanges, investments, and index funds. We should get them out of retirement accounts and our pension plans. They refuse to be transparent about their accounting practices. We shouldn't be putting American investors and retirees at risk. Of course, he... He he totally uh, is opposed to Joe Biden's exact proposal. Okay. Scott also said the U.S. needs to face off against communist China and international institutions. We cannot let Beijing into positions of power at the United Nations, at the IMF, the World Bank, or the Olympics. All uh, accents... Insulting accents are uh, totally the domain of the originator, which is more. Section 32. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, In addition to numerous provisions, I started reading a previous paragraph. Excuse me. In addition to numerous provisions aimed at protecting the partnership between the United States and Taiwan. Section 3219G of the legislation would ensure, quote, economic, diplomatic, and other measures to deter and impose costs of any use of force by China to change the status quo of Taiwan. Of course, Scott asserted, we need to end our policy. I'm sorry, I got to get back to the insulting accent. We need to end our policy of strategic ambiguity with Taiwan. I've introduced the Taiwan Invasion Prevention Act to make clear that we will come to Taiwan's defense if Beijing invades the island. Oh, but now he he opposes that. Now, Scott's controversial 11-point Rescue America plan, lambasted by Democrats and even by Fox News for raising taxes on over 100 million Americans. You know, he's going to raise everybody's taxes uh, that were uh, anybody making 50,000 bucks and less. You know, their taxes are going to get raised. But he was going to get another tax cut. Uh, So... uh, Uh, And uh, allowing vital programs, I'm sorry, like Social Security, Medicare and Medicaid to expire every five years also includes a call for an America first strategy to make the United States less dependent on China. America will be dependent on no other country. The act states it will gradually end all imports from communist China until a new regime honors basic human rights and freedoms. We will build supply chains that rely solely on American workers and allies. We will not be at the mercy of our enemies for medications or any essential commodities. And yet they continue to lie about what we are doing. Brian Disco and Holly Raymer of the Associated Press brings us this next offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy Smothered Benedict Wednesdays. A former Trump administration official now running for Congress in New Hampshire voted twice during the 2016 primary election season, violating federal law and leaving him at odds with the Republican Party's intense focus on election integrity notice how every time we we hear about these uh voting twice even mark meadows and his wife i mean how many times is this going to go on how about the villages in florida how many uh repeat i mean oh my god i'm flummoxed 
Matt Mowers, a leading Republican primary candidate looking to unseat Democratic Representative Chris Pappas, cast an absentee ballot in New Hampshire's 2016 presidential primary voting record show. At the time, Mowers, or is it Mowers, served as the director of former New Jersey Governor Chris Christie's presidential campaign in the pivotal early voting state. Four months later, after Christie's bid fizzled, Mowers cast another ballot in New Jersey's Republican presidential primary using his parents' address to re-register in his home state. And that was from documents the AP obtained through a public records request. Legal experts, <clears throat> excuse me, legal experts say Mower's actions could violate a federal law that prohibits voting more than once in any general, special, or primary election. That includes casting a ballot in separate jurisdictions for an election to the same candidacy or office. It also puts Mowers, who is a senior advisor to Trump's administration and later held a State Department post, in an awkward spot at a time when much of his party has embraced Trump's lies about a stolen 2020 election and has pushed for restrictive new election laws. The reason they think that they have to have these laws is they think how easy it is for them to cheat, so everybody must be doing it. This final offering here in the Bistro Cafe part of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. The House will vote today on whether to hold former Trump advisors Peter Navarro and Dan Scavino in contempt of Congress after their months-long refusal to comply with subpoenas from the House committee investigating the January 6th attack on the U.S. Capitol. If approved as expected, the criminal referrals will be sent to the Justice Department, which would decide whether to prosecute. Scavino, a communications aide, was with Trump the day of the attack on the Capitol and may have materials relevant to his videotaping and tweeting messages that day, the committee said. Navarro, a former White House trade advisor, was subpoenaed in early February over his promotion of false claims of voter fraud in the 2020 election that the committee believes contributed to the attack. All right, that brings us to our break, and we better go to our break. And when we get back from said break, we will go through an abbreviated weather from around the world, and we will finish up with the stories that we have curated for you today. You are listening to West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, and we will be right back. You are listening to NetworksRadio.com. Please hang up and try again. From a point at sea to the circles of your mind, a new force is at work for planetary transformation. New radio for a new earth. This is Take Two Movie Review. I'm Clinton Johnston. This week, Arting the Storm. In Infinite Storm, director Malgorzata Zumoshka, director of photography Michael Englert, writer-actor Joshua Rollins in his first produced feature screenplay, congrats, and actor Naomi Watts tell the true story of Pam Bales, who, as a New Hampshire mountain search and rescuer, climbed Mount Washington in November 2010 to memorialize, or brood about, her two deceased daughters. While there, she found a disoriented young man in shorts and tennis shoes, suffering from exposure while an early winter storm settled in on them both. 
Most of the press is focused on Jumoshka's background as a documentary filmmaker and on Watts working with Bales herself and on their harrowing shoot on a Slovenian mountain in order to quote unquote get it right because it's easy to judge a realistic film's worth by how real it looks. And it's also easy when acting can be a matter of imitation rather than interpretation. However, I'd like to talk about some of the artistry in this film. First off, Jumoshka agreed to do the film if her producer supported her call for no flashbacks. She actually ends up using a handful and I can respect her initial instincts because even though they provide useful background, they took me out of moments I didn't want to be taken out of. Most importantly though, Jumoshka uses a number of two people mid shots and close ups to make this film feel close, which is smart because this is not a film about isolation. It's about a world of people inseparably connected to each other. Even the long establishment shots that show how alone Bales is at her home or on the mountain don't make those places loom or feel overwhelming. They just are, allowing you to catch their starkness or their beauty as befits you. The movie's other themes are what you'd expect, the indomitability of the human spirit, and that one can find resilience and even beauty on the other side of suffering. So does Infinite Storm work? Depends. Are you an ass half kicked or a mountain half climbed kind of person? This has been Take Two Movie Review. I'm Clinton Johnston. Catch up with us at TakeTwoMovieReview.com and feed us back on our channel channel on YouTube. Hi, I'm Tom Harbin, and since you're listening to NetrootsRadio.com, show your progressive side and go to the donate button on the bottom of the homepage. It's progressives like you who power Netroots Radio and keep the progressive message beaming everywhere 24 hours a day. Just go to our donate button at the bottom of netrootsradio.com. Thank you for keeping Progressive Radio at full power. Welcome to 60 Second Civics, the daily podcast of the Center for Civic Education. I'm Mark Gage. Abraham Lincoln briefly left politics after his first term as a U.S. congressman. Public opinion had turned against him because he criticized President James Polk for leading the nation to war against Mexico. But national controversy over the 1854 Kansas-Nebraska Act brought Lincoln back to intense political activity. The Kansas-Nebraska Act gave the people within certain western territories the right to choose, by majority vote, whether or not slavery could lawfully exist among them. Senator Stephen A. Douglas of Illinois called it popular sovereignty, but to Abraham Lincoln it seemed more like popular tyranny, providing the possibility that majority rule could be used to establish slavery within territories from which it had been legally and justly prohibited by the federal government. Lincoln adamantly opposed the Western extension of slavery. Lincoln joined the new anti-slavery Republican Party, which nominated him to oppose Douglas, the Democratic Party's incumbent candidate, in the 1858 Illinois senatorial election. That's all for today's podcast. The show's theme song is Complacent by Cheryl B. Englehart. You can find Cheryl online at cbemusic.com. 60 Second Civics, where civic education only takes a minute. In 2022, does censorship work? I'm Bill Newman, and this is the Civil Liberties Minute. On Russian state-controlled television, facts about Putin's invasion of Ukraine have been replaced with a relentless barrage of propaganda, endless hours of repeating that Nazis run Ukraine, and Russia needed to invade that country to save itself. Under a new law, any journalist or media outlet that asserts anything to the contrary faces 15 years in prison, with the result that in Russia, opposition to the war has been silenced. Over 80 percent of Russians, according to recent polling, support both the war and Putin. So, from Putin's point of view, his totalitarian censorship is working well. But dictators are not the only ones who utilize censorship. Some elected officials in the United States today are using an American milder version of this theme. Recently, some states have enacted laws that, in broad strokes, prohibit the teaching or discussion in public schools of material that may be deemed critical of some of the history of the United States, such as the slave trade, slavery, Jim Crow, segregation, racial violence, and lynchings, what we used to call facts and history. Recent events have made plain 
that we should condemn and fight censorship anywhere and everywhere, any time it rears its ugly head, in whatever form. The Civil Liberties Minute is made possible by the ACLU because freedom can't protect itself. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. Often, southern states are the focus of histories of slavery in the United States. But did you know that in the early 1700s, one in five residents of New York were enslaved Africans? New York merchants had a trading relationship with the Caribbean, which had a large enslaved population. This brought enslaved people to New York. But since there were no large plantations in the colony, most of these enslaved people worked as carpenters, fishermen, or stonemasons. On this day in labor history, the year was 1712. A group of 20 to 70 enslaved Africans armed themselves with guns, swords, and hatchets. They set fire to a building in the center of town, attacking the white settlers who tried to put the fire out. The armed insurrection killed nine white settlers and injured several more before the militia arrived. As many as 70 enslaved and free black people were arrested for the revolt. Several chose to commit suicide rather than go to trial. More than 20 were executed, most were hung, and a few were burned at the stake. The revolt resulted in the passage of tougher slave codes. Enslaved people were forbidden from carrying weapons or meeting in groups of three or more. Punishments could include whipping. For the next 150 years, this pattern repeated. Slave uprisings in the United States would be followed by brutal repression and a tightening of slave codes. In New York, slavery remained legal until 1799. Even then, New York only adopted an act for the gradual abolition of slavery. This meant that those enslaved before July 4, 1799 would remain in bondage. Slavery was not fully eradicated in New York until 1841. Labor History in Two brought to you by the Illinois Labor History Society and The Rick Smith Show. For more information, go to laborhistoryin2.com, like us on Facebook, and follow us on the Twitters at Labor History in Two. Thank you for accompanying us here to the Chef's Table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy Smothered Benedict Wednesdays. We always begin weather from around the world along the banks of the Rogue River. In the Rogue River Valley of Southern Oregon on the west coast of the continental United States of America. Where it is currently 34 degrees Fahrenheit with a bit of fog that has actually lifted above the mothership at the moment. And we're going to be much warmer today. Uh, Highs uh, between 77 and 80 with partly cloudy skies, winds light and variable. Lows in the mid 40s tonight uh, with mainly clear skies, winds light and variable. And tomorrow, except for a few afternoon clouds, mainly sunny with highs in the mid 80s, winds light and variable. We are going to now skip right to weather from around the world, which is brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that are crowd crowdsources from around the world. London is 57 degrees with rain. Paris is 56 and cloudy. Rome is 52 and mostly cloudy. Kiev is 53 and cloudy. Kabul is 65 and partly cloudy. Hong Kong is 71 degrees and fair. Tokyo is 60 and fair. Sydney, Australia is 65 degrees with showers in the vicinity. San Francisco, California is 53 degrees and sunny, and New York, New York is 48 degrees with rain and a flood advisory. And that is weather from around the world, brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that are crowd, crowdsources from around the world. She 
Speaking of the Wasadu of the Associated Press, brings us this first amuse bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. A Nigerian court has sentenced an atheist to 24 years in prison for making social media posts that found to be blasphemous against the Islamic religion in the Western African nation's northern region. Mubarak Bala, an ex-Muslim, was sentenced yesterday, Tuesday, after pleading guilty to charges of blasphemy. The sentence was the climax of a lengthy trial during which he spent nearly two years in prison. Bala is the president of the Humanist Association of Nigeria, and activists say his conviction illustrates the risks of being openly faithless in the northern Nigeria area, which is predominantly Muslim. Prosecutors in the northern Kano state accused Bala of making Facebook posts that insulted the Prophet Muhammad and the religion of Islam and attempted to cause a breach of the public peace, according to court documents. Bala long maintained his innocence over the charges of blasphemy, but he changed his plea to guilty only after enormous pressure for the past few years, says Leo Igwa, founder of the Nigerian Humanist Association. Bala was tried in a secular court, but could have risked a death sentence in Nigeria's Islamic courts that operate in other parts of the country's north. Je te donne mon amour pour la vie entière La promesse de me trouver à tes genoux Aussitôt que tu m'appelles Rester toujours fidèle C'est tout C'est tout Je te donne tous mes printemps Mes étés de mer Mais autant quand les feuilles tombent partout Si ce n'est pas une bonne affaire Je te donne tous mes hivers Jill Wallace of the Associated Press brings us this final amuse-bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Two of naturalist Charles Darwin's notebooks that were reported stolen from Cambridge University's library have been returned two decades after they disappeared. The university said yesterday, Tuesday, that the manuscripts were left in the library inside a pink gift bag, along with a note wishing the librarian a happy Easter. The notebooks, which included the 19th century scientist's famous 1837 Tree of Life sketch, went missing in 2001 after being removed for photographing, though at the time staff believed they might have been misplaced. After searches of the library's collection of 10 million books, maps, and manuscripts failed to find them, they were reported stolen to police in October of 2020. Local detectives notified the global police organization Interpol and launched an international hunt for the notebooks valued at millions of pounds. On March 9th, the books reappeared, left in a public area of the building outside the librarian's office, which is not covered by security cameras. The two notebooks were wrapped in cling film inside their archive box and appeared undamaged. The accompanying note said, Librarian, Happy Easter, Kiss Kiss. Darwin filled the notebooks with ideas shortly after returning from his voyage around the world on the HMS Beagle, developing ideas that would bloom into his landmark work on evolution on the origin of species. The university's director of library services, Jessica Gardner, said her feeling of relief at the book's reappearance was profound and almost impossible to adequately express. The notebooks can now retake their rightful place alongside the rest of the Darwin archive at Cambridge, at the heart of the nation's cultural and scientific heritage, alongside the archives of Sir Isaac Newton and Professor Stephen Hawking, she said. The note books are set to go on public display from July as part of a Darwin exhibition at the library.
Cambridgeshire Police said its investigation was continuing, and they said we are following up some lines of inquiry. We also renew our appeal, the force said, for anyone with information about the case to contact us. Indeed. Well, that brings us to the end of our broadcast period for the day, but you do know Netroots Radio broadcasts on, and we will meet up tomorrow for Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursdays. So do stay tuned to Netroots Radio all day and all night for all the breaking news as it breaks, and we will meet up here tomorrow, right here. In West Coast, cookbook and speakeasy. Bon Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des TL, des photos de bord de mer, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais du frais d'Astère Revoir un latte coël Je voudrais toujours te plaire Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je veux déjeuner par terre Comme au long de golfe clair T'embrasser les yeux ouverts Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver